tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 12 in the book Tramp for the Lord by Corey Ten Boone. The title of this chapter is God Will Provide. And the scripture passage we're going to read is Luke chapter 10, verses 4 and 7. So Luke 10 and 4, Jesus said, Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And verse 7 says, And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Father, I thank you that your word promises that if we acknowledge you in all of our ways, that you will direct our steps. And Lord, as we open up this lesson tonight, I pray that you will direct and anoint our hearts and minds to receive what you would have us to receive and that you would speak as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. God will provide chapter 12. The people in America seem to feel I should not hesitate to ask for money for my ministry, which supports other ministries such as Bible and book translations in many parts of the world. However, from the very beginning of my ministry, I have felt it was wrong to ask for money, even to ask for travel expenses. I did not want to be paid for services rendered. I simply wanted to preach the gospel and let the Lord provide for me. I learned this lesson very early in my traveling ministry. I was in England and spoke, among other things, about the former concentration camp where I helped refugees in Germany. My host had asked me to do this, saying they knew the American people would like to help support it. After the meeting, a dignified, well-dressed lady came up to me and handed me a check for a large sum of money. It was designated for my work in Europe. It was so very interesting to hear about your work, she said. And what did you think about the other things I said, I asked. Did you find them important also? She gave me a quizzical look. I continued, of course, it is a very good thing to give money for evangelistic work, but today I also spoke about conversion. God does not want a little bit of your money. He wants all of your heart. He wants to possess you completely. God will not let me take your check. I handed it back to her. As I was speaking, I noticed a haughty, proud look come into her eyes. Very deliberately, she pulled her fur cape around her neck. Then, without answering at all, she arrogantly walked away. When I got back to my room, I looked sadly at the other checks which had been given to me. Was God speaking to me? Was it wrong to speak of my own work, while at the same time I urged people to be converted or to forgive their enemies? Was it wrong to listen to these Americans who were urging me to receive collections for my ministry? I dropped to my knees in prayer. God knew my needs. The answer was very clear from the Lord. From now on, you must never again ask for money. Great joy entered my heart, and I prayed, Heavenly Father, you know I need more money than ever before. But from this day on, I shall never ask a penny. No guarantees before I come to speak. No travel expenses. Not even a place to stay. I will trust in you, believing that you will never forsake me. That very day I received two letters. One was from a woman from Switzerland. Corey, God told me that from now on you must never again ask for money. The other letter was from my sister in Holland. She wrote, When I prayed for your work this morning, God made it clear to me 
that you should not ask anybody for financial support. He will provide everything. I thought of the night in the concentration camp when my sister Betsy and I had talked of our plans for the future. Corey, we should never worry about money, she said. God is willing to supply for our every need. Many years later, when I faced a severe hardship, I was forced to remember this principle. I felt like I had received a direct command from the Lord to go to Russia. The price of our tickets and expenses would be 5,000 guilders. However, when I looked at my checkbook, I found we only had 3,000 guilders in the bank. Lord, I prayed, what must I do? You've commanded me to go to Russia, but I need 2,000 more guilders. I thought that this time God would let me write a few wealthy friends, telling them of my need and asking them to send the money for the plane ticket. Instead, I heard a very clear directive from God, give away 2,000 guilders. I thought this time, (laughs) Oh no, Lord, I said as I sat at the table in my apartment in Barn, Holland. You did not understand. I did not say to give away 2,000 guilders. I said I needed someone to give me that amount so I could go to Russia. However, God seldom listens to my arguments. He waited for me to get through with my objections and then repeated his original command. This time, though, it was even more specific. I was to give 2,000 guilders to a certain mission group that had an immediate need. I could not understand how anyone's need could be more important than my own, but foregoing the wisdom of the wise, I sat down and wrote a check to this mission group, depleting my bank account down to 1,000 guilders. Later that day, I went back down to see if I had received my mail. Among the letters was one from the American publishing company that was to publish The Hiding Place. For some months I had been writing back and forth, and only two weeks before I had finally signed the contract. I brought the letter back upstairs and opened it, and as I pulled it out, a check fluttered to the floor. It was an advance from the publisher, money which I did not think I was going to get, until the manuscript was completed. I looked at the figure... It amounted to more than I needed. God takes his prohibition of asking for money very seriously. Just as he means it seriously when he says he will care for and protect us. However, if we seek to raise our own money, then God will let us do it by ourselves. Many times we will be able to raise great amounts of money by human persuasion or downright perseverance in asking, but we will miss the far greater blessings of letting him supply for all our needs according to his own riches. And as I found out in the case of the guilders needed for the trip to Russia, God always has more money for us than we think of asking. I would much rather be the trusting child of a rich father than a beggar at the door of worldly men. What a good quote. I'm going to reread that quote. It's good. I would much rather be the trusting child of a rich father than a beggar at the door of worldly men. Yes, the Lord is not only my shepherd, he is my treasurer. He is very wealthy. Sometimes he tries my faith, but when I am obedient, the money just always comes in, just in time. My last stop on my trip to the Orient was Formosa, Taiwan. It was time for me to move on, so I went to the travel agency in Taipei, Taipei and gave the girl a list of the places I needed to go on the next leg of my journey, Hong Kong. Sydney, Auckland, then back to Sydney, on to Cape Town, Tel Aviv, and finally to Amsterdam. The travel agent wrote it all down and then asked, What is your final destination? 
Heaven, I answered simply. She gave me a puzzled look. How do you spell that? H-E-A-V-E-N, I spelled out slowly. After she had written it down, she sat looking at the paper. At last, she looked up. Oh, now I understand, she said with a smile. But I did not mean that. But I meant it, I said. And you do not need to write it down because I already have my ticket. You have a ticket to heaven? She asked, astonished. How did you receive it? About 2,000 years ago, I said, noting her genuine interest. There was one who bought my ticket for me. I only had to accept it from him. His name is Jesus, and he paid my fare when he died on the cross for my sins. A Chinese clerk working at the next desk overheard our conversation and joined in. What the old woman says is true, he told his companion. I turned and looked at the Chinese man. Have you a reservation for heaven? I asked him. His face lit up with a smile. Yes, I have, he said, nodding enthusiastically. Many years ago, as a child in the mainland, I received Jesus as my Savior. That makes me a child of God, with a place reserved in the house of the Father. Then you are also my brother, I said, shaking his hand. Turning back to the other clerk, I said, When you do not have a reservation for a seat on the plane and try to get aboard, you face difficulty. But when you do not have a place reserved for you in heaven and the time comes for you to go, you end up in far greater difficulty. I hope my young brother here will not rest until you have made your reservation in heaven. The Chinese clerk smiled broadly and nodded. I felt confident he would continue to witness to his fellow worker now that I had opened the door. I left the travel agency with a good feeling in my heart. Surely God was going to bless this trip since I had already I was already off to such a great start. However, when I arrived to my room and checked the ticket, I found the girl had made a mistake in the route. Instead of sending me from Sydney to Cape Town to Tel Aviv, as I had requested, she had routed me from Sydney to Tel Aviv and then to Cape Town. Why have you changed my schedule? I asked. My chief has told me I must first go to Cape Town and then to Tel Aviv. However, you change the sequence. God is my master and I must obey him. Then God has made a mistake, she said, half seriously. There is no direct flight from Australia to Africa, since there are no islands in the Indian Ocean for the plane to land and refuel. That is why you must first go overland to Tel Aviv and then down to Cape Town. No, I argued. I cannot follow that route. I must do what my chief has told me. I'll just have to pray for an island in the Indian Ocean. We both laughed and hung up. Lord, I prayed, if I've made a mistake in hearing your direction, please show me. But if I heard correctly, then open the way. An hour later, the girl called back. Did you really pray for an island in the Indian Ocean, she asked, incredulous. Before I could answer, she continued, I just received a telegram from Qantas, the Australian airline. They have begun to use the Cocos Islands for a refueling station, and beginning tomorrow, will have a direct flight from Sydney to Cape Town. I thanked her and hung up. It was good to know that God does not make a mistake in his plans. However, I am stubborn and never seem to learn my lessons well. Just a few days later, after I got to Sydney and was to make 
a short trip to Auckland, New Zealand, and back I ran into another situation, which would have been easier for me had I remembered the lesson I learned back in Formosa. Since I was only going to be in Auckland for four days before returning to Sydney and then to Cape Town, I packed all my essential items in one suitcase, which I could carry with me. I left the other suitcase with my friends in Sydney, planning to pick them up when I came back on my way to Africa. Besides my essential clothing, I also took with me my notebooks, Bibles, literature, and colored slides. My slides taken in many lands and the manuscripts of my sermons are all very valuable to me. Although I seldom read from my notes when I speak, I feel more comfortable when I have them before me. I have been accused by my friends of ascending the platform with three Bibles and five notebooks. I think it is hardly that bad, but I have met a many met so many people and jotted down so many ideas that I cannot remember them all. So I try to carry all my notes with me. As I started to leave the Sydney airport for the plane, one of the pilots spotted me struggling along with my heavy suitcase. He volunteered to help me. I have to stop by the radio room first, he said, but I shall bring your bag directly to your seat. I hesitated to turn loose my bag. However, since it was filled with everything I needed for the rest of my journey, not to mention a lifetime of treasures. You can trust me, he insisted. I will arrive at the plane before you and shall live, leave your bag on your seat. Reluctantly, I parted with my suitcase and watched the pilot as he walked out the door. Several minutes later, we boarded the plane and I rushed to my seat. The bag was not there. Alarmed, I called the stewardess. She assured me the bag had been stowed with the rest of the luggage and was perfectly safe. I tried to settle back in my seat as we took off, yet I had an uncomfortable feeling inside. The plane made a stop in Melbourne before heading over the Tasman Sea for New Zealand. However, when we landed in Melbourne, there was a radio message waiting for me. Like Job, the thing which I greatly feared had come upon me. The message was from Sydney. A bag belonging to Corey Ten Boone had been left in the radio station room. I was frustrated and angry. Can they send it to me? I asked the ticket agent. I'm sorry, he said, shaking his head. The only way we can get it to you is send it on our next plane to London. From there it will go to Rome, then Tel Aviv, then... Ugh... I groaned, waving him to be quiet. That will never make it. It contains all my earthly treasures, and it is not even locked. Tell them just to hold it for me in Sydney. I shall pick it up when I return in four days. In the meantime, I have nothing, not even a toothbrush. I reboarded the plane and slumped into my seat, dejected, angry and full of resentment. On the flight from Sydney to Melbourne, I had witnessed to the stewardess about my faith in Jesus Christ. I had told her that Jesus was the victor in every situation and that he gave us the power to praise him in all situations. Now, I, however, I did not feel very much like praising him at all. I looked up and the stewardess was bending over me. How wonderful it must be to be a Christian! In a time like this, she said, most people would be full of anger and resentment. I forced a smile and said, well, it must be for some reason. Nothing happens by chance to a child of God. Even though I was speaking the truth, I was not walking in victory. Victory would mean I had no resentment at all, and that moment I was overflowing with it. It was late in the evening as the plane took off from Melbourne. It would be a night flight to Auckland, and I tried to make myself comfortable. Below us was the sea, with only the engines of the plane to hold us in the sky. I dozed fitfully and then woke with the smell of smoke in the cabin. The other passengers were awake also, and some of them were up in the aisle expressing concern. Moments later, the stewardess was 
at my seat. I have good news for you, she said softly. We are returning to Sydney to pick up your bag. Yes, indeed, good news for me, I said, but tell me, are we not in great danger? No, she said, sweetly smiling and patting my pillow. We are just having some hydraulic difficulties. There is no danger. I followed her with my eyes as she went from seat to seat, assuring all the passengers that there was no danger. I leaned across the aisle and asked the man in the next seat what was meant by hydraulic difficulty. It's bad news, he said. All the mechanisms on the plane depends on the hydraulic system. The wind flaps, the steering mechanisms, even the landing gear is controlled by the hydraulic system. Since the fire is in the system, it means the pilot could lose control of the plane at any moment. I sat back in my seat and tried to look out the window. Below was the blackness of the Tasman Sea. The smell of smoke was still very strong in the cabin. I was not afraid of death. Often, as a prisoner, I had faced it. I remembered the words of Dwight Moody. The valley of the shadow of death holds no darkness for the child of God. There must be light, else there would be no shadow. Jesus is the light. He has overcome death. Yet I knew I was not right with God because I was not right with man. I still held resentment in my heart and knew it had to be removed before I could even pray. I leaned back in my seat and opened my heart to God, confessing my resentment over my suitcase, which was worthless to me now that we might crash into the sea and asked him to forgive me. Then I prayed, Lord, perhaps I shall see you very soon. I thank you that all my sins have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I opened my eyes and looked around me. What of the others? I wondered, are they prepared to die? No one was sleeping. All were sitting alert in their seats. I noticed a woman busy applying lipstick and shook my head. How silly to feel you have to enter eternity with painted lips. I had the strongest urge to stand up and say to the people around me, Friends, perhaps in a few minutes we shall all enter eternity. Do you know where you are going? Are you prepared to appear before God? There is still time to accept the Lord Jesus. But I could say nothing. I wanted to stand and urge them to come to Jesus, but I could not. I was ashamed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and not only that, there was fear in my heart. We finally made a landing, a safe landing in Sydney. My bag was returned to me, but there was no joy in my heart, even... Though I had been forgiven of all my resentment, I had been ashamed of the Lord Jesus. I found a seat in the lounge and sat with my head bowed and my eyes closed. Lord, dear Lord, I am not fit to be a missionary. I stood before the very porters, portals of eternity and I warned no one. <laughs> I opened one of my notebooks and read on the margin of a page a note I had made many years before. To travel through the desert with others, to suffer thirst, to find a spring, to drink of it and not to tell the others that they may be spared is exactly the same as enjoying Christ and not telling others about Him. Oh, Lord, I moaned, send me back home. Let me repair watches. I'm not worthy to be your evangelist. I sat there like Jeremiah, trying to reign, to resign my commission. I saw a man coming toward me. He introduced himself as a Jewish doctor who had been aboard my flight. I watched you all through the hours on the plane. When our lives were in great danger, he said, you were neither afraid nor anxious. 
What is your secret? A ray of light. Perhaps God gave me another chance. I am a Christian, I said joyfully. I know the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. He died on the cross for my sins and for yours also. If our burning plane had fallen into the sea, I had the assurance of going to heaven. We sat for and talked for a long time before he excused himself, but a few minutes later he was back again. I must hear more about this Jesus, who gives you such peace, he said. Four times he got up and left, and yet he kept coming back. Each time his request was the same. Tell me more about Jesus. I told him how Jesus gives us authority over Satan, how Jesus has promised us mansions in heaven, how he gives to all who believe the power to become the sons of God. The Jewish doctor drank it in and finally left saying, I had given him much to think about. I sat back in my chair. The Lord, my treasurer, had just given me enough of his wealth that I might share it with one of his hungry children. I had been found worthy to evangelize after all. And in the process, I had learned another valuable lesson in the school of life. When I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12 and 10 And this is the end of the chapter. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness in the life of Corey Ten Boon and that your faithfulness is still the same to this day that you help your children And you give us the grace to speak to others of your goodness. I pray, Lord, as Corey uh, was able to share the gospel with this Jewish doctor, Lord, and that you drew him to you with a hunger to know your truth, I pray you'll continue to do that in the lives of the listeners tonight, in my life as well. Help us, O God, to share your goodness and just to be a blessing as you've been a blessing to us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.